of our viewers in the Diocese of Amarillo, Texas, wrote his bishop recently and sent him a copy of a videotape of programs from What Catholics Believe. We'd like to deal with the bishop's response, which we have with us today, because he perhaps raises many issues which are in your minds or perhaps which many people have addressed to you. I'm Julius Smetona. This is what Catholics believe. With me today are two priests who celebrate the traditional Latin Mass exclusively and who have remained loyal to the traditions of the Church. Father Clarence Kelly, Superior of the Society of St. Pius V and Spiritual Director of the Daughters of Mary, a congregation of traditional Roman Catholic sisters in Round Top, New York. Also, we have with us the editor and publisher of the Roman Catholic, Father William Jenkins, who is also the pastor of St. Therese Church in Parma, Ohio. Reverend Fathers, we received this letter from Bishop Leroy Matheson, Leroy T. Matheson, from uh, the Diocese of Amarillo, Texas, and he wrote to one of our viewers as follows. I have finally been able to view the videotape and read the material you sent me. You ask me if we have two Catholic churches, and you also ask me to respond to the questions the priest on the videotape are talking about. So I will give you the first question the bishop responds to. He says, first, do we have two churches? One, in quotes, one that is a post-conciliar and one that is true Roman Catholic, unquote. The answer is no. The Church is always one, holy, Catholic, universal, and apostolic. Christ said he will be with the Church until the end of time, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The priests in the videotape belong to a schismatic Church, that is, a Church that has broken away from Rome and who are in disobedience to the Holy Father, the successor of St. Peter, whom Jesus selected to be the head and foundation on which he built his Church. The first thing is that uh, one may determine whether he has or has not broken away from Rome on the basis, first of all and supremely, of what he believes. In other words, does he believe what the Roman Catholic Church believes? Does he believe what the Roman pontiffs have infallibly defined? And I think if you examine what we believe and you examine what is preached, what is taught, what is professed, in the post-Vatican II Church, you will find that what we believe is what the popes taught, and what they believe is what the popes have condemned. Uh, with regard to the question of authority, certainly, if you have an undisputed uh, pope on the, on the chair of Peter, then you are obliged to submit to his authority. But it is possible, it is not contrary to Catholic teaching, as this uh, gentleman Suggest I think he signed the letter Leroy. That's right, he signed as, it Leroy. As he suggests, yeah. it is not contrary to the teaching of the Catholic Church uh, to say that in a given instance there is objective reason to believe that a particular pope either is a doubtful pope or he is no pope at all. We have had uh, cases in the history of the Church, the case, for example, of St. Catherine of Siena, St. Vincent Ferrer. St. Catherine of Siena favored uh, Pope Urban VI, uh, St. Vincent Ferrer favored Clement VII. They were two men who reigned at the same time. Half of the Catholic world supported Urban, half the Catholic world uh, supported uh, Clement. One saint was on one side, one saint was on the other side. So each of those saints doubted that the other one was the real Pope. You certainly cannot say that they rejected the authority of the papacy. Yes, in you. fact, it is precisely because we acknowledge the authority of the papacy that we are traditional Catholics. That's why we recognize that what came out of Vatican II uh, is not Catholic. By their fruits, it's clear. Uh, the results of Vatican II have been disastrous uh, for faith. Um, and, uh, you know, in morals, too, there's a general breakdown. Uh, the number of vocations has, has dropped drastically. Uh, all of the diocesan newspapers are lamenting the fact that they're suffering a severe drought of priestly vocations. The trouble is uh, they ascribe the, uh, all of these problems to uh, uh, the fact that they haven't changed enough. Uh, now, if you were taking a medication and uh, that 
was followed by all of these terrible symptoms. Uh, I don't think you'd fall for any doctor who told you that the problem is you're not taking enough of the medication. You should take more and more. Take more arsenic. It'll make you feel good. Right. Huh? Well, that's exactly the message of these post-conciliar bishops. Right. And I mean, what he's giving here is a catechism answer. But what I find so ironic is that's not the answer that they'll give to liberals. They'll use that answer on conservative Catholics who still recognize the authority of the Pope. But when it comes to, to liberals, they won't even appeal to anything like that. They'll, they'll go off on some other tangent to try to, to meet the liberals. It seems that they, they always pull for that authority card uh, to try to use that to bludgeon conservative Catholics into submission, into submission right. because they know that, that that's the, the ace in their, in their hand. But they don't answer any of the questions. He doesn't answer to the problems that are happening to the church and to the faith of the Catholics today as a result of Vatican II. He just pulls out kind of a stock answer here. For example, if you went to his diocese and you questioned the priest in his diocese and you said to them one by one, Father, do you enforce the teaching of the Catholic Church in the confessional, if you hear confessions, do you enforce the teaching of the Catholic Church on unofficial contraception? Will you insist that a person abide by the teaching of the Church? And will you refuse absolution to someone who will not? Or do you say to them, follow your own conscience? The answer that you will invariably find is that they will point out that the best way is to go without it, but you're a mature person, you're an adult, you can make up your own mind, you can follow your own conscience. Then if you say to them, but what about the popes? Don't the popes condemn that? They will say, oh, well, they're speaking as theologians then. They're not speaking with authority. Mm -hmm. You invariably find that. It's you the know, same thing in the seminaries, you know, when they teach things, even with regard to Vatican II, when I was in the seminary, I mean, what they're doing in the counts in the seminaries has gone far beyond anything that the Vatican II says, but in the seminaries, if you were to question the liberal professors and the modernists and you said to them, what you're teaching, what you're saying is contrary to the documents of Vatican II, and you show them the documents, what they will say is, well, Vatican II is a springboard. But if you don't want to go along with their reforms, they say to you, you're against Vatican II. You know, it's interesting. The, the next point, uh, Bishop Matheson, Matheson, I don't know how the name is pronounced, he raises, I believe, is theologically unsound. He says, that is the basic fact, that you're disobedient. Then he goes on to say, to try to maintain that Pope John Paul II is not the real Pope is to deny the Holy Spirit the, quote, unforgivable sin, unquote, as Jesus described blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. It's, it's absurd. Uh, and quite frankly, what it reveals is, it really reveals a, a kind of a, a desperate attempt to sweep under the rug some very serious concerns of priests and people about the changes that have taken place, to suggest that it is a sin against the Holy Ghost, to question whether or not a particular individual is the Pope, would make St. Vincent Ferrer That's right. guilty of this sin against the Holy Ghost, but St. Vincent Ferrer is a canonized saint of the Catholic Church. So either, either he was so blinded uh, in a kind of rage, perhaps, when he wrote that letter, or he doesn't understand ecclesiology. He does not understand the teaching of the Catholic Church, which is very possible. I mean, I don't know how old he is. Or the third possibility is that he does understand and that he doesn't have the faith anymore. Mm -hmm. the, the next point, as uh, Bishop Matheson proceeds, he said, he talks about the Mass. He said, quote, to maintain as these schismatic priests do on the videotape that the Latin Mass formulated by the Council of Trent in the 16th century is the only true Mass is to fly in the face of reality. The first Mass was celebrated by Christ in Aramaic. Mass was celebrated in Greek during the first several centuries. The Kyrie eleison of the Latin Mass is actually Greek, a remnant of the time when the entire Mass was in Greek, and possibly retained because some folks maintained ideas that the Greek Mass was the only true Mass. As a matter of fact, the entire Eastern Rite section of the Catholic Church never did celebrate Mass in Latin, but in Greek, Lebanese, Arabic, or whatever their native language is. Well, see, so here's setting up a straw man and knocking him down, because the question is not really one of language. 
Uh, we do see the value of Latin in maintaining the purity of the faith, but uh, no one is suggesting that the Latin Mass is the only true Mass. The Church has had Eastern rites from the very beginning, and these are all true Catholic Masses. They, they express, express the same faith as the traditional Latin Rite Mass. The problem is that the new Mass is not a Catholic Mass. It doesn't express the Catholic faith. It was never intended to by the people who created it. Uh, it was created with the idea of being an ecumenical mass that would be acceptable to non-Catholics who could interpret it in the way that they believe. There were six Protestant ministers who were called to the Vatican to review the new mass before it was issued. And ever since then, the promise that the new mass held in the minds of its creators has, has been, been uh, fulfilled in, in the, way, the way it has served, or I should say, abused the church and abused the faith of the Catholic people. Everything that has happened since the New Mass came out follows perfectly within the spirit and the teaching of the New Mass. Taking the tabernacle, putting it off to the side, somewhere out of the way, uh, emphasizing the community, experiencing fellowship, uh, where we, we find Christ in each other now, not Christ in some sacrament, uh, such what the Church used to call the, the Holy Sacrament or the Holy Eucharist. This is, uh, this is a total fabrication. This, this faith that came out of Vatican II. And it, it is particularly evil because it is designed specifically to replace the Catholic faith, but to sit in the place of the Catholic faith as though it were the Catholic faith. Same with the new Mass. It is designed to replace the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And it is, at best, for any objective observer, an imitation of an Anglican or Lutheran service. And it's a rather poor imitation because if you were to go into, for, for example, a high church Anglican uh, community and you saw the way their minister performed uh, their service, he would do it with considerably more dignity than you would find in the average uh, Nova Soto church. But it would be impossible to miss the striking resemblance between what is done in a Protestant church and what is done in all of these churches now throughout the country. The very reforms, though introduced by Martin Luther, and the Protestant reformers have been introduced into Catholic churches throughout the whole world. They, these men are not uh, ignorant. They're not stupid people. These are intelligent men, men who know about history, men who know about theology. They know all about this. They know all about history. Uh, they, and they know why Luther introduced the table and got rid of the altar. They know why Luther introduced hand communion. They know why Luther made the priest face the people instead of saying mass at an altar with his back to the people. They, they know that Luther set out to destroy the sacred character of the Mass, to destroy the, the, the difference between the priest and the people. And what they simply did was they went back and copied all those Protestant things which convey a different meaning. I mean, there is just a radical, uh, an essentially different meaning between a Protestant service and a Catholic Mass. We believe that the Mass is the renewal of the sacrifice of Calvary. We believe that the bread is changed into the body of Christ and the wine is changed into His blood. We believe in that change and we go down on our knees to worship our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. The Lutherans would say there is no sacrifice anymore. There is only the one sacrifice of the cross and that sacrifice uh, is not renewed on the altar. This is simply a commemoration, a celebration of the community of the faithful. And even the Lutheran uh, variation of the real presence, the Lutherans differed from the Calvinist, for example. The Lutherans said that the bread is not changed, but the body of Christ is there. The wine is not changed, but the blood of Christ is there. When you get down to it, it is uh, fundamentally and essentially the same. It is a denial of the real presence in the sense of transubstantiation. It is the denial of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Now, anyone with any common sense, I mean, you don't have to be a theologian. All you have to do is use a little common sense. If they went back and imitated the Protestant worship service, no altar, communion in the hand, the, uh, the destruction the of the separation between uh, the, the priesthood of of the priest and the so-called priesthood of the faithful. And you, you now, in the 20th century, copy, imitate, create a new liturgy which contains all these things. Why? 
No, because what they want to do in the Catholic Church, what they did in the Protestant Reformation. Anyone who would say any different is just not being uh, realistic. It's just common sense. I've had Anglican converts tell me that the, the Anglican uh, communion service is more Catholic than the new mass that came after Vatican II. <laughs> You're watching what Catholics uh, said that the, uh, the hierarchy of today's post-conciliar church uh, know their history, but I, I don't see the evidence of that in this letter <laughs> because the bishop says that the, the Latin mass formulated by the Council of Trent in the 16th century well, actually, the traditional Latin Mass does not come down to us from the 16th century. It was merely codified for the entire Latin rite of the Church uh, at that time. In fact, the Mass that we offer, the traditional Latin Mass, now called the Tridentine Mass, it's a misnomer, but they call it that, comes down to us uh, word for word. The canon comes down to us word for word for the time of Pope Gregory the Great, about the year 600. So it was formulated word for word already before the year 600. We have sacramentaries going back into the uh, fourth century. Uh, Pope Leo the Great, for example. And uh, we find the Mass substantially the same as what Father Kelly and I offer every day of our lives. And so to say that this was a 16th century uh, invention is absolutely false. And it's, with, with, it's an, a conscious attempt, I believe, to make it look as though Paul VI did exactly the same thing. And so there's nothing unusual with what Paul VI did in the 1960s. Well, what Paul VI did in the 1960s in creating a new rite of mass was t completely uh, departure from the Catholic life and uh, the, all of Catholic history. You know, when he published it, he didn't call it a new rite. He called it a new order. And a new order indicates a complete and radical change. And so even the selection of the words that were used to introduce the new Mass indicate that it was a, a radical and substantial change from the Catholic way. Here's what the bishop continues. He says... Well, the, well, oh, yeah. One more thing, Julius, I'd like to say okay. that uh, Father Jenkins is right. You know, it doesn't seem that he knows his history, but the reformers at the council, they are the ones who know their history. They know exactly what they were doing. So we have the intention, we have the production, and we have also the effect. Because when we say that this new liturgy is a copy or an imitation in many ways of what the Protestants did in the 16th century, we can also say that it has produced the same result as the change of liturgy produced in the 16th century. When Martin Luther wanted to turn Catholics into Protestants, he did not get up in the pulpit and say, my dear brethren, you should be Protestants. What he did was he changed the Mass. And he changed the Mass little by little. He de-emphasized the priesthood. He de-emphasized the, the doctrine of the church on transubstantiation. And eventually, the people got used to it. He began to distribute communion in the hand. And eventually, the people became Protestants. That's how it worked. And that is what has happened now. The result of this new Mass, for any honest person to see, is the Protestantization of the Catholic multitude. Catholics today no longer believe, for the most part, in the Catholic faith. In many, many ways, what they believe and what they do is virtually indistinguishable from what others do. So the effect has been produced. The intention was there, the liturgy was produced, and a Protestantization of the Catholic masses has occurred in every single way with regard to doctrine, with regard to morals, and with regard to worship. And the saddest part of it is that many of these people calling themselves Catholic don't even realize that they don't, even, they don't even have a concept of what the Catholic faith really teaches. If they were to take one of the old catechisms and look through it, to them that would be an alien, alien form of belief. <laughs> you know, the bishop goes on and he makes this point. He says, the priests make charges on the videotape that are so ridiculous I am flabbergasted, e.g. that the, quote, bishops are not against abortion, unquote. How they can make such a statement is beyond me. Every bishop I know from the pope down to me 
is absolutely unalterably opposed to abortion and have stated so publicly again and again. Where is the evidence for it? I mean, we have had some bishops uh, who have gone out and gotten arrested and protested in front of abortion clinics and marched against it. But those are by, by far the exceptions. I mean, so exceptional, in fact, that it makes big news when a bishop does anything overt against abortion, takes a stand. Most of the, of the comments are very weak-kneed and uh, almost apologetic, and it's an embarrassment to the Catholic people. Um, not only that, uh, you have to judge by what a person does, not by what he says. A person could could issue all the nice statements, this is bad and that is bad, and then proceed to appoint people who believe those bad things. The proof is in the pudding. What are they teaching at Catholic universities? What are they teaching at Catholic colleges? What are they teaching in Catholic seminaries? That's the proof of the pudding, not uh, sanguine, uh, uh, saccharine, uh, type statements uh, giving lip service to one or another teaching of the church. What do they teach? I know what they teach. I know what they taught in the seminary that I was in. And I'm not talking about 1982. I'm talking about 1970 and 1971. I am the one that was taught, for example, by a professor of moral theology who was trained in Rome that if a psychiatrist recommended adultery as therapy, he was open to the possibility of that being moral. I was taught that there is no such thing as an objective moral law, and that this includes, in terms of intrinsically evil, abortion. That abortion is not necessarily intrinsically evil. Those are the things that they were, they were teaching back then. I can imagine what they're teaching now. You know, you even have the, the issue of if these bishops are really against abortion, why don't they excommunicate Mario Cuomo? Why don't they excommunicate uh, Ted Kennedy? Why don't they excommunicate Jerry Brown? Mm -hmm. Why don't they excommunicate Father Charles Curran or uh, <coughs> Bishop Weakland? And on, and on, and on, and and on. on endlessly, it seems. <laughs> and you know, that, uh, what Father Kelly said applies to the next statement uh, the bishop makes here. They say, meaning we say, mm -hmm. most priests don't believe in the real presence. Well, actions do speak louder than words, and most priests, it seems, act as though they don't believe in the real presence. Certainly, if someone believed that the host is truly the body and blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, he wouldn't just have people handing it out at six or seven different communion stations in the church and having people walk away with absolutely no concern for the particles of the host that fall on the floor. And these bishops know that particles of the host are falling on the floor. They know it as well as I do, and they don't care. You know, I was told recently by a priest, uh, an older priest, who has uh, been through quite a few things with regard to the changes in the church, his experiences of women putting the, uh, what's supposed to be the consecrated host in the glove compartments of their cars. These extraordinary ministers who are going around to the hospital, you know, and the, the so-called nuns. In fact, there have been numerous surveys have been done which show that many priests do, in fact, uh, doubt the real presence at some time or another. In fact, many theologians are denying this publicly. The Code of Canon Law, the new Code of Canon Law, embodies a certain flaw in the faith explicitly because it says that Catholics, quote unquote, may receive Holy Communion from non-Catholics who believe in the real presence. Well, you know, Lutherans say they believe in the real presence. Does that mean a Catholic can go to a Lutheran who got himself consecrated, say, by an Orthodox priest? <clears throat> what does that do? That undermines the exclusivity of the Catholic faith. It gives the impression that what we believe is what others believe. Mm -hmm. You know, he makes this point about communion in the hand. He continues, they condemn receiving communion in the hand. In doing so, they condemn Christ himself who, quote, took bread, blessed it, broke it, and said, take and eat, this is my body, unquote. The apostles took the bread in their hands. Were they desecrating the body of Christ? Of course not. Of course, the apostles they were, were priests. They were, priests. Bishops. They were bishops. bishops. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And maybe, maybe he doesn't recognize that fact, but they were. Right. They were priests and bishops. Uh, but that doesn't prove anything anyway, because they exercised extreme caution. And, uh, you know, even if in the early centuries communion was given hand to hand, there was extreme caution used, and uh, non baptized, uh, anyone non baptized was not even permitted to stay for that part of the Mass. It shows how careful they were with the Blessed Sacrament. Now, 
you know, that our listeners, our viewers should know that we're not saying these things as a personal attack on this bishop, Mathieson, if that is how his name is pronounced, but merely to answer the charges that he makes. I would want him to return to the true faith and to begin practicing it again. That is why Christ created the Episcopacy and the papacy. Uh, we have to pray for that, but uh, while praying for it, we cannot go along with the new religion. We have to stand up and cry from the housetops, this is wrong. And in doing so, we are performing a great service to our fellow Catholics. You've been watching what Catholics believe. I'd like